Hello! Welcome to part 5 of the Fire Emblem Sync Marathon. This part, we'll be looking at the many ways the series has handled magic, using these chapters as reference from each mainline title. We're getting new mages in most every game this part, but some highlights will be Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia, where we start Act 2 and get a whole new starting cast of mages, Thracia, where this time Asbel actually gets to sweep everything, and Conquest, where Odin routes the Ice Tribe. When considering magic systems, I am specifically looking at how offensive magic is handled. For most games, this will mean looking at how magical combat is balanced, but some go even further in giving magic unique effects and interactions that let players more fully engage in the game in a mystic, alternative manner. My qualifiers for a well-designed magic system are, does magic stand out from physical combat, does it incentivize engaging strategies, and does it synergize with the overall context of the game? With this in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Shadow Dragon, and the Blade of Light Mirth marches the Elysian army to the northern Elene's castle, where we hope to reunite with Princess Nina, who is being protected by Hardin and his cavalry. While we start in the east, Hardin's group starts by the mountains in the west, and we'll need to reach a bridge for our armies to meet up. Until then, Hardin needs to fend off some thieves, archers, and knights, assisted by the cavaliers Roche and Biraku, and the bowmen Wolf and Zagaro. Hardin's a pretty strong cavalier himself, but Roche and Biraku are a bit closer to our current cavaliers. The bowmen's stats don't stand out, but I do think that pairing high movement with bows is interesting. I like Wolf's design in Shadow Dragon a lot, so of our new recruits, I'll be focusing on Wolf. In the east, Marth has to fight a small group of enemies who are surrounding the bishop, Wendell. The spacing works out such that Marth can directly move towards the village, and Wendell can walk up to Marth and recruit himself. I had Marth and Abel wait in range of the Cavaliers turn 1. Abel crit one, and Marth and Cheetah picked up the other kills on player phase, setting up for the Wendell recruitment turn 2. His stats actually seem fairly high, but I'd much rather focus on our other mage, Merrick. Last chapter showed how powerful his Excalibur Tome can be for boss killing, and while his performance against most enemy types doesn't seem to be particularly outstanding yet, he is absolutely excellent against the high defense, low resistance knights, who most of our physical units are only doing a couple points of damage to. As such, I rush Merrick over to Hardin's group in the west, who were struggling against the enemy knights. I had set up the cavaliers in the forests, blocking off the bowmen. This theoretically would make for a solid choke point, in which the cavaliers dodge a bunch of hits, and the bowmen get to safely shoot down the enemies. However, Roche and Biraku quickly found themselves at low HP, the enemy archers were threatening our bowmen, and the bulky knights made it impossible to go for a full player phase sweep. Kane and Ogma just barely made it in time to help kill the archers and thieves, but I had to make a defensive formation to keep the cavaliers safe from the knights until Merrick made it. From there, a couple cavaliers and a Pegasus knight approached from the west, which Wolf, Hardin, Kane, Ogma, and Merrick were able to handle. I left most of our army behind in the east though, <laughs> trapping the archer and setting up for a couple levels on Lena. It'll be a while until Lena is able to use magic, and while we haven't had much time with Merrick yet, the map seemed to reflect pretty well for the place of mages in FE1. The implementation of tomes seems to match that of physical combat, having weapons that can be traded and require a certain weapon XP stat to wield. However, here we see some standards set for how magical combat stands out from standard physical attacks, hitting enemy resistance rather than defense, and consistently having weapons with 1-2 range. This gives mages strong damage output against certain enemy types and flexibility in positioning, which is typically balanced by the wielder being frail and having lower movement. I feel that a good balance of the strengths and weaknesses of mages is very important if the only way your magic system distinguishes itself is through its combat. So far, I'd say FE1 does a good job with this balance. Enemy knights were genuinely tough to safely defeat with my physical units, but Merrick wasn't exactly able to just run across the whole map and sweep everything, trailing a bit behind the cavaliers and only being able to survive a hit or two. Not only did I feel encouraged to use Merrick, but using him felt a bit more strategic than, say, sending Kane to sweep fighters. Utilizing his flexible range to avoid counterattacks and work around cramped positioning in the mountainous terrain made for some pretty thoughtful turns, and I hope future maps continue to encourage thoughtful use of our mages. I suspect that the High Might Excalibur may eventually fall off as our answer to bosses, but for now it's still going strong, especially considering that this chapter's boss is a knight himself. I was actually a bit confused by this boss, as there was another knight next to him standing on a two-tile castle. 
Marth just needs to seize the point under the boss, but I still had Merrick, Burn, and Excalibur used to kill the other knight, as retribution for my first attempt when the knight surprised me by moving off the castle and killing Merrick. Knowing about this for my second attempt, I just made sure to kill the knight on player phase, still having enough time to get the boss kill, by the time Marth had visited the Firestone Village, delivered the Silver Sword to Harden, and reached the seize point. Gaiden. Act 2, Selica's Leave. Our perspective switches to that of Gaiden's other protagonist, the priestess Selica. We start in the Priory, where Selica resolves to set out from Mila's temple. There, she hopes to seek Mila's aid in restoring the land of Sophia, which has recently become overrun with pirates and terrors. To assist in her journey, she brings along the mages May and Bowie and the cleric Jenny, giving us a fully magical starting cast. Like Alm, Selica serves as our leading unit to start, having all-around solid combat stats. As a mage though, she hits the early game enemies really hard, and this can keep up through the end of the game as she unlocks new powerful spells. May focuses more on attack and speed, and has a more explosive spell list, already starting with Thunder. On the other hand, Bowie focuses more on defense, and a spell list that's a bit more delayed, giving our army some niche differences. I would like to ensure high performance from Selica, so I give one attack and one speed from the starting fountains to her, and in good faith of her future performance, I give one speed to Jenny. As we know, getting killed with Nosferatu can be tedious, but I find the payoff for training Jenny early on can be quite strong, so the focus for Act 2 will be getting her kills whenever possible. Our first battle is a skirmish in Novus Cemetery, with a handful of terrors scattered across the map. There's a fair amount of terrain between forests and graves, but in Gaiden, magic ignores terrain. This means the terrain is completely in our favor here, but it doesn't really matter as the enemies are extremely weak. I run everyone forward together, with the mages teaming up to leave the terrors at low HP, then letting the terrors attack into Jenny on the enemy phase to give her maximum chances to land killing blows. The terrors hardly give a lot of XP, but in setting up most of the kills for Jenny, she got close to her first level up. A pretty boring map, but it still serves as a fine enough sandbox to get adjusted to how mages work and get your unit of choosing a head start on experience. We now get to explore Novus Port. Here we encounter the mercenary, Saber, who Selica hires as protection. He ironically has the same defense as Selica, and having physical combat makes him comparatively pretty weak at base. However, his high speed and lack of spell weight lets him double more, he doesn't consume HP to attack like our mages do, and he can definitely grow to be a strong leading unit after promotion. With Saber recruited, Selica secures a ship, and we set sail on a journey to Mill's Temple. Blocking our path is a long sequence of pirate encounters, with maps featuring two boats connected by single tile planks. I imagine Gaiden wants you to put the new physically bulky unit Saber out front, with the mages using their spells to sneak in attacks from behind. These pirates are so weak though that we can just lead with our mages. Bowie ends up in front at first because of the starting positions, but I switch to Jenny turn 2. Her damage output isn't that high, but I'll take any chance for Jenny XP I can get. Even Selica wouldn't have had the strongest enemy phase here, as her priestess class can attack with swords, and the game defaults to counterattacking with her default physical sword attack rather than fire. Still, her player phase magic attacks hit very hard, and with some help from May's 3 range thunder, I'm able to push past the choke point and move Jenny onto the enemy ship by turn 3. She stays safe thanks to Nosferatu healing, gets an awesome first level, and the last two turns are just spent finishing off the enemies that she weakened. These boat maps can be a bit frustrating with healing AI involved, but this really only delays the victory by a turn or two, with our mages ignoring the avoid boost and keeping their 80 max hit when casting fire or 50 hit in the case of Jenny's Nosferatu. <sighs> we move on to our second battle in Sophia Sea. Here, the pirates are joined by an archer and a tough mercenary that drops a leather shield. We also have two planks, letting some pirates approach us from the west while we fight the mercenary in the east. This actually makes for a pretty challenging enemy formation, but a choke point and our many strong ranged magic attacks gives us the tools we need to overcome it. I send Saber and Bowie to fend off the pirates approaching from the west, while Selica takes the lead in the east. Here, counterattacking with the physical sword attack is actually great, as it leaves the pirate alive and gives us more time to hit the mercenary at range. I get a lot of unlucky misses against both the mercenary and archer, 
but Jenny gets a lucky dodge against the archer, and it works out such that the mercenary is defeated and the archer gets healing AI before either can land a lethal blow on Celica or Jenny. From there, it takes just a couple turns to weaken the pirates at the choke point and finish out the one that got healing AI. Overall, Gaiden's magic system stands out a lot from the standard approach established by FE1 that uses tomes as a weapon type, and there's a lot that I like about it. For one, magical combat absolutely stands out from physical, always having might and hitting the typically lower res stats. Magic's consistency also stands out, as you can expect to see the same hit rates in every round of combat, regardless of terrain. Mages always have 1-2 range, sometimes even 1-3 range upon learning spells like Thunder. Rather than durability, these benefits of spells are balanced by an HP cost. It's pretty minimal now, with the standard fire only costing 1, but in combination with the typically low defenses of mages, it limits the ability for mages to sweep large groups of enemies on their own, and encourages the player to be a bit more thoughtful when using the strong, high HP cost spells that come later. Not only does using spells feel strong and strategic, but the acquisition of spells is also interesting. Each unit gets their own list of spells they learn at certain levels, which helps the mages feel unique. It also plays well into Gaiden's leveling system. Unlike physical classes, mages only promote once and at later levels. The spell system, then, gives an alternative incentive for training mages, getting access to new offensive tools rather than high base stats. Basically, Gaiden's magic has engaging combat, and its overall system fits within the context of the game, while still keeping a separate identity from physical combat. With Celica as the leading force in a whole starting cast centered around the system, and with me just generally resonating with her character, I'm sure you can understand why I might say Celica is my favorite lord in the series, and I look forward to using her in the rest of the run. Mystery of the Emblem Sheeta brings news that Emperor Hardin has conspired with the General Lang and is now attacking Marth's homeland of Altea. We rush back and must fight past Lang's occupation army to reclaim Olburn Castle. Last part, I was very optimistic that Mystery of the Emblem's redemption arc would continue, but I'm sad to say that Chapter 5 has immediately broken this, providing a return to form with Draconites hovering over mountains, a village in a faraway corner, forest and mountain tiles slowing Marth's progress, and unclear enemy recruitments. We also have Ballista, but the Flyers can skirt the range while still chasing after the enemy thieves running away in the north, and I find the Ballistician boss more amusing than threatening. For new characters, there's the sniper George in the northeast, but if he's recruitable, it's definitely not in this chapter, as he and his snipers just serve as further pressure when chasing after the thief. At the end of the last chapter, we got Sheeta, and while she feels more immediately strong than in FE1, we already have the likes of Pala and Katria in our army, and she's going to need a bit of a training arc. Finally, we have the thief Rickard, who Julian recruits turn 1. He brings with him the VIP card, which lets us visit secret shops. I have no idea where they're located, and I apparently missed one on this very map, but at least Rickard gives us a second thief, which may speed up the pace of any future maps with many chests and doors. After recruiting Rickard, we're left in quite a precarious spot. There's cavaliers rushing us from a choke point in the south, a thief with a knight crest running north, and a group of cavaliers and mages covering the thief's tracks. To handle all this, I moved Sirius and Luke south to fight the cavaliers, sent as many of the infantry units behind them as possible, and had Linda block the bridge from the north. All the while, the Pegasus knights flew up the mountains, just barely skirting the ballista, draconite, and sniper ranges on their journey to cut off the thief in the far north. Having a frail mage hold a choke point may seem like a strange play, but thanks to her Nosferatu spell, she healed enough HP to survive multiple hits on the enemy phase, easily setting up kills for the next player phase, which her other mage, Yubello, greatly appreciated. By turn 3, Paola just barely reached the thief in the north, getting the Oko with a javelin while staying out of Draco Knight and sniper range. Katria and Sheeta followed, eventually killing a cavalier that stayed up north. The Pegasus knights then just stuck around, waiting for our own cavaliers to push through the south and instigate the Draco Knight fight. Luke did pretty well, using the Rider's Bane to one round on the enemy phase, just barely surviving by dodging one of many attacks. This cleared the way for Marth to continue moving full move every turn, with Linda following right behind him, easily okoing the <laughs> zero stat boss with Aura. From there, it was basically just the Draco Knights left. Well, just the Draco Knights completely undersells the situation, but as one would expect from Pala, she one-rounded one with the crit, 
serious crit to others, and Linda got some solid magic damage in on the Draconite that attacked her. While magic overall feels pretty standard again in Mystery of the Emblem, I really do appreciate the unique tomes that Linda gets to wield. Aura's massive might lets Linda help with boss kills, much like Merrick with Excalibur, but also getting Nosferatu gives her some solid enemy phase presence. Both of these strong tomes are balanced by limited charges, which seems fair for Aura, but perhaps a bit too low for Nosferatu to see heavy use in more than a few chapters, unless we get more. Regardless, managing weapon durability seems to be relevant, but not too stressful in Mystery of the Emblem, and I'm glad that this was made consistent for tomes. I will say, though, that magic outside of Aura and Nosferatu feels a bit underwhelming. 1-2 range and hitting enemies on resistance is always nice, but we have many physical combat units, like Pala and Sirius, who can already kill the bulkier enemies on their own, and it feels like the mages are kind of just tailing behind and picking up whatever kills are left. This makes the frailty of Linda and Nibello feel a bit undeserved. Now, we do have the Wind Magic Shaver, which gives Linda a great matchup against these early, slow Draco Knights. We also have the promise of effectivity against Mana Keats, if I'm reading the stat screens correctly, which may result in some fun, volatile matchups. We're not there yet, though, so for now, Mystery of the Emblem's magic is mostly about Linda situationally being useful and setting up kills for Yubello. To speed up this training arc, I have Yubello take a few rounds at the arena while we wait for Marth to walk through the mountains. He actually beat three rounds on his first try, earning some solid experience and gold. Finally, Marth reached the village, earning us the Hamern staff. I was willing to have Marth walk back through the mountains, but I was under the impression that the Hamern staff would let us repair the rescue staff in the future, so I just had Yumina rescue Marth back, letting him seize the very next turn. Tragically, I was informed later that Hamern cannot repair staves in Mystery of the Emblem, but surely this will be the last chapter where rescue saves like 20 turns. This time for sure, right? Genealogy of the Holy War. With Harheim captured, Sigurd now sets his sights due north on Anthony Castle. While their cavalry fights through a block of knights and a line of cavaliers, Lewin has his own mission of clearing out the brigands in the center of the map. Lewin is a speedy mage, but he can't actually double due to a lack of the pursuit skill, and has to rely on triggering adept or critical to get one rounds. With the support of our dancer Sylvia, though, He's got enough time to two-shot all the brigands before they can burn down any of the villages, with the northwestern one being especially important to save. Sylvia's dance skill actually lets her refresh all adjacent units, making for quite the explosive plays. We won't see this in effect until next chapter though, as Sylvia is going to stick around and visit villages for gold while our combat units handle the castles. First up for our cavalry is the knight formation. Like last part, not having a Zell around makes it a bit tricky, but Lex is able to tank them decently well, and after Finn talks to Quan, he earns the Brave Lance, with which he can quad and one round the knights. The knights are quite strong though, and some even have two range bows, so I don't get a Finn sweep. In fact, I actually kind of have to run back a bit, using Kanto to weaken the knights on player phase, then move out of range. This led to an awkward defensive formation, with the knights threatening to surround the cavalry. In anticipation of the enemy cavalry rushing us from the north, I had to go for a couple pretty tense player phases to clear them out before the boss could waltz down and finish off a weakened unit, what with his threatening 9 move, high attack, and adept skill. The sword cavalier Beowulf also complicates things slightly, as we can recruit him by having a unit talk to him and give him 10,000 gold. Because Beowulf sticks close to the boss group, this means leaving a unit in range of a lot of enemies, but thankfully, the generic Sword Cavaliers are very weak, and I can easily send Lux forward to recruit him, blocking the boss's path south, and tanking the Sword Cavaliers alongside Sigurd and Quan. Beowulf seems to be fine as a unit, adding to our cavalry and being able to double for solid damage, but I don't particularly care for his attitude, so I'll just be using him for offhanded combat alongside the likes of Noish. Here he just runs back, forcing the Cavaliers to attack into my other units with better bulk and offenses. While dense enemy formations such as this don't reflect well for units with low defenses, including our mages, I definitely think there's room for magic to have strong contributions in genealogy. Mages are a great answer to the physically bulky knights, and getting to outrange most every enemy is pretty nice considering the scarcity of healing. The traditional setback of low move is even more notable in genealogy, but I feel it really only holds them back in this one chapter where the time incentive was really strict. 
Now, the dense enemy formations do make mages' low defenses feel pretty rough. For what it's worth, this does encourage making defensive formations when player phase sweeps might fail. As demonstrated in this chapter though, the physical units can do well enough on their own, so I can understand players who want to rush castles with the cavalry feeling a bit disappointed. There are a few aspects of magic and genealogy that help their combat feel appropriately strong, and just generally a bit more engaging. For one, certain mages get some cool skills and tomes that give them truly impressive damage output. We can also pair mages with certain rings to give them a critical boost. This chapter we get the Pursuit Ring by having Arden slowly walk his way to the beach, with which Lewin will be able to double enemies on top of his proc skills. I'll also mention genealogy as not just the introduction of Weapon Triangle for its melee weapons, but also a separate triangle for the different magic elements. Mages aren't the most frequent enemy type, in fact we haven't encountered any at all yet, but at least the plus 20 hit and avoid boost is actually impactful when it does show up. Theoretically, we should be able to see this magic triangle in effect next part, with Lewin's wind magic at a disadvantage against the fire mages, but while the cavalry finishes the boss at Anthony, Lewin is still visiting villages in the center of the map with Sylvia. Ethlyn will eventually return him back to the home castle, but that's also on delay, as I had Ethlyn stick around to heal the cavalry as they weaken the boss. With the hit and avoid boost that Lachesis provides nearby allies with her charm skill, I'm able to land enough hits to set up the kill for Ethlyn herself. Anthony Castle is set to seize, and will next set her sights on the final two castles in the northeast. It'll take some time for our cavalry to backtrack, but I've left our infantry behind, with Azel poised to counter any enemies that may come our way. Thracia, 776. Leaf has just about escaped the monster prison, and we get a glimpse of hope to break Avalot with us, alongside her daughters Nana and Merida. Unfortunately, Raedric pits Avil against some tough arena fighters, who she must protect Nana from, and Merida is nowhere to be seen. Through circling around the arena pit, we hope to open the door to the arena in the north, then push through the mages charging from the west, and escape in the southwest. Nana is quite the frail unit as a troubadour, so I have her run away to the door, healing Avil as she blocks Nana off. Her earth sword is a strong magic weapon with the Nosferatu healing effect, but considering her, uh, unideal stats, her contributions for me will mostly come from her staff utility and the hit and avoid boost she provides nearby allies with her charm skill. Meanwhile, Leaf's group fights through a few knights and mages in the southeast, with Lifus, of course, stealing a fire tome. This gives us a very extensive inventory of tomes with just one mage in Asbel, and we'll get even more against the mages that wrap around from the west, but with foreknowledge, I know that enemy mages eventually become scarce, and I want to make absolute certain that I have enough tomes for our mages going forward. As we see from Asbel this chapter, magic hits knights and other physical units pretty hard, even with his low base magic and the low might of fire. It's enough to set up these early kills for Asbel though, and we move on to the soldiers in the north. By now, Raedric has summoned Merida, only to reveal that she's being controlled and is now pitted against Avil. Avil won't counterattack her, and Nana can generally heal off the damage that Merida deals, so we're safe to let Merida block off the other arena fighters and take our time setting up for the turn while we'll break them out. Fergus takes the lead at first with the flame sword, then switches to Asbel being out front, with Leaf nearby to provide his support bonuses. Supports in Thracia are a bit odd, being rare, not conveyed, and only working one way. I at least know of the Leaf Asbel support though, as pushing his hit, crit, and avoid by 10 is pretty impactful on his ability to consistently defeat strong bosses or large groups of weaker enemies, such as these mages. I've secured the area around the arena door, but before proceeding we have to consider a certain chest, which is placed at the end of a very long pathway running along the eastern walls. I send Lifus to get it, and he saves a couple turns with his Vigor Stars giving him an additional action a couple times, but it still wastes a lot of time. I figure there's no point in breaking Avil out until after getting the chest, so I take this time to grind more staff rank on Nana, and have Asbel go back and fight some of the arena fighters across the wall. He accidentally triggered a Berserker's healing AI with a double crit, but after critting the Swordmaster, I was able to rescue him out of the way and open up space for Leaf to get the kill. After also drawing over some of the archers in the north, Lifus finally caught up with the group, and I was set to open the arena door. Leaf goes to meet Avil, but before we can make our escape, the Dark Bishop Veld interrupts, using his Petrify Staff to turn Avil to stone. Veld and Raedric take their leave, and while we still can take Nana with us, Merida is whisked away. 
With no hope to revive Avil, Leaf must focus on his own escape and save rescuing Avil for another day. By now, the intimidating hero Galzas has showed up in the arena, but thankfully he retreats and we can focus on wrapping around to the southwest. Fergus again takes the lead to fight the remaining archers and general in the north, setting up the kill for Nana. I let the sage in the northwest burn a lot of their meteor uses while Aspel approaches and sweeps the nearby knights and soldiers, so I ultimately just forewent the capture. Asvel again took the lead for the south, fighting the sniper and remaining mages. He's not super bulky, but because of the life ring, he just barely could live all three hits, and the low hit rates gave Asvel a lot more survivability than one might expect. This experience of dodge tanking and dealing massive damage on the enemy phase is my main frame of reference for mages in Thracia. Magic typically hits physical enemies hard while being more neutral to magical enemies, but this distinction is made even stronger in Thracia, with the magic stat doubling as both magic and resistance. Thracia mages are still quite frail to balance this, but enemy hit rates are pretty low, so if you're feeling risky, mages can make for strong leading combat units. This takes away from the typical tactical experience of using mages, but I find that the risk factor and Thracia's resource management keep it in check. If using careful positioning to give a charm and or support boost, you can mitigate the risk factor, and tomes aren't exactly in limitless supply, so if you want to make the most of a mage, you really have to engage with stealing and capturing. In addition to the strong combat potential and unique handling of the magic stat, magic is also given the same element triangle as in genealogy to feel distinct from physical combat. Because Thracia's weapon triangle bonus is so minimal though, it hardly feels impactful. I'll also admit that the existence of magic weapons like the Flame Sword make the mages feel less special to me, as we see here with Fergus matching Aswell's combat while having consistent survivability. For players not willing to risk enemy phase sweeps, mages are also more limited to their typical role of careful player phase attacks, in which engaging with stealing becomes less encouraged. Personally, I enjoy mages in Thracia for their combat, but I can understand why other players might find them more underwhelming than uniquely engaging, outside of rare cases like Graf Caliber. In the end, Asbel was able to get a lot of solid action in, but it was up to Fergus to handle the final enemies guarding the chests in the west. I just had him one round one of the Dark Bishops with the Brave Sword to ensure that everyone stayed safe on the enemy phase, but secure the capture for the Dark Bishop with Physic. It took a bit of extra time to have Brighton walk down to capture the Southern Cleric, but I was ultimately able to safely escort Nana with the rest of the army to the escape point, and we're all set to leave Monster Castle. We're leaving Avil behind, but Leaf vows to grow stronger and rescue her one day. We'll be back, Avil, I promise. Binding Blade Roy continues on his path to Ostia, and while crossing a mountain pass, accepts the request of a nearby village to fend off a group of brigands. Our seas point is in the southwest, and like Thracia, we must wrap around in a circle. The villagers, however, present us with another option. By waiting in front of the wall in the south, the villagers will open the gates, letting us cut directly to the seas point. Of course, this puts us directly in range of the massive boss group, with hard mode adding a tough wave of reinforcements if you do so. Suffice to say, I don't feel our army is adequately prepared for this challenge, so I just decided to wrap around and fight the enemies in their smaller groups. Unfortunately, the map ended up being not just boring as a result, but also quite frustrating. As we see from this first group, the fighters are really strong, easily two-shotting our units and even okoing our frailer units such as Lu. The mercenaries and nomads are fast, strong, and dodgy, further supported by the forest tiles scattered across the map. I leave Merylness behind to visit the houses, but even with everyone else moving together, consistently taking out these enemies while fulfilling my goals of training certain units and keeping a fast pace was rough to say the least. I will say that this map is a pretty good showing for the recently recruited Rucker, who alongside Deke faces sub-30 hits from the fighters and can come close to one-rounding. Still, he's not guaranteed to dodge everything, and combined with the mercenaries and nomads being around, I ended up putting together as many kills on player phase as possible. This sounds like the perfect scenario in which a mage might be useful, but unfortunately this is not the case. Between a low magic stat, the low might of tomes, high enemy HP values, and not doubling, Lu is only providing minimal chip damage. Sure, he avoids counterattacks and has more tolerable hit rates than, say, our fighters, but his offense is certainly lacking. As mentioned though, his durability is hardly existent, and I even have to rely on him dodging a hand axe while on the mountain to survive. I know that Lu can eventually double, 
will get a mage that at least hits harder, and stronger tomes will become available, but I can't help but feel Binding Blade hard mode restricts the potential of magical combat a bit too much, while only making its downsides worse. While magic's combat doesn't particularly shine yet, I suppose the mages being so frail makes for an even stronger encouragement to tactically utilize their 1-2 range. We also see the inclusion of another distinct magic weapon triangle, this time between anima, dark, and light. I don't believe enemy mages are all too common though, and its impact on hit and avoid isn't that strong. This magic triangle will be consistent for all the GBA games, and while I don't feel it's very impactful in practice, I still appreciate it in theory, letting mages stand out while still getting to interact with similarly engaging systems that physical units do. After pushing past their first groups of fighters and mercenaries, the next big hurdle was taking on a group of mercenaries and nomads in the forest. Some brigands had crossed the mountain and neutralized Merlinus, and I left Boars and Wade to block the forts in the east in case any reinforcements might appear, but otherwise I still had my whole army around. Because they were just so dodgy though, I couldn't really go for a big player phase sweep, so after killing the Nomad, I made a wall with Deke, Rucker, and Marcus to hold the mercenaries off. This was quite tedious, but with Wolt in the back providing ship damage and ready to pick up kills, I eventually pushed through and continued moving my clump of units to the seize point. Even with only a few units left, the terrain made it difficult to handle at a fast pace, with the final mercenary, brigand, and mage filling up a line between the castle and mountain. To make matters worse, reinforcements were set to appear in the next couple turns, so I pretty much had to finish this group and the boss now, lest my weaker units in the back get surrounded, and the brigands in the south catch up with Boris and Wade. Lou set up the mercenary for Shanna, Rucker set up the brigand for Wolt, and Deke one-rounded the mage. Next turn, I leave it up to Rucker to handle the boss, getting a crit on enemy phase and perfectly setting up the kill for Wolt. This puts him just about to hit level 9, but he's also left with one iron bow use left, and I didn't think to buy another last chapter. Whoops. Regardless, we've just barely outpaced the reinforcements, and with Wolt clearing the path to the castle, Roy is set to seize and put this experience behind us for good. Blazing Blade Hector's army settles in loss for the night, but is caught off guard by a mercenary group, with the nomad, Selin, attempting to seize the throne. Our mission is to defend the throne for seven turns, guarding the three openings to the throne room, and ideally reaching the chest in the south and defeating the boss in the east. Our deployment is limited, so of course we must bring only the best of the best. That's right Marcus, you'll have to sit this one out for Rebecca. This leaves me with just Hector, Oswin, Loan, and technically Guy, who can take many hits. Oswin suggests sending himself to tank the many enemies in a fairly open area, but I opt to have him solo the eastern hallway instead, getting two shots with the javelin. Hector takes Oswin's suggested place in the south, where Loan is in desperate need of assistance after pushing forward to clear out the soldiers turn one. Guy, on the other hand, has it pretty easy in the west. Rebecca breaks the wall and weakens the Nomad, setting him up to get the kill, then dodge tank the many fighters in the area. The knights in the south are quite bulky and threaten Lowen if left alive for too long, so to set up for a turn 2 player phase sweep, I'll leave our mage Urk in range of 1 turn 1, getting the 1 round on enemy phase. This coincidentally puts him in the boss's longbow range, which does mean that Urk needs to dodge 1 of 2 hits. In doing so though, the south becomes a lot more manageable while pushing forward, and getting the boss to move now means that Oswin can fight him sooner. Turn 2, I just barely am able to pull off the player phase sweep, with Urk killing another knight, Hector setting up an archer kill for Eliwood, and Lowen setting up the other archer for Matthew. I leave the thief alive, but they go after the chest room anyways, and the surviving knight just attacks into Eliwood, who won rounds with the rapier. From there, Hector and Lowen hold the choke point in the south, leaving room for Urk to safely attack from behind while Matthew and Rebecca chase after the thief. While I wasn't planning to use Urk long term, I think this was a cool chapter to show how engaging magical combat can be. The knights are bulky to the point where physical units struggle while Urk can just one round them, but the enemy density and Urk's frailty really encouraged me to work with the terrain to block off enemies from hitting him, or just otherwise put together a ton of calculated player phase kills. The defend condition and map design makes it so Hector and Oswin can't just tank everything, and the turn limit encourages more aggressive plays involving Urk. However, I don't necessarily think that every chapter makes magic this fun to use. Still, if magic is essentially just going to be another weapon type, I appreciate it when the differences in its combat get to shine. 
with Blazing Blade enemy quality being lower than Binding Blade, mages can actually fulfill their role as units with high damage that you need to use carefully, rather than being an underwhelming way to weaken enemies. So yeah, I really hope that future enemy composition and map design can continue to facilitate this fun usage of mages, as much as I suspect this might not be the case. Though the main threats were taken care of in the first few turns, the ending of the map still ended up being pretty tense. Hector's group had a lot of enemies to fight in the south, with the cavalry reinforcements pouring in from the southeast, and I at times played a bit risky with my formations to go for occasional Ellywood kills, or just otherwise push further forward. While Guy was never necessarily at risk in the east thanks to having a vulnerary, all the hand axe reinforcements certainly kept him busy. Matthew just barely reached both of the chests in time, and Oswin took until the last turn to land a finishing blow on the boss. With a longbow, they were able to reach Merlinus from across the wall, but in doing so, let Oswin trap them in a corner, getting the two shot thanks to the Rider's Bane from last chapter. Unfortunately, there were just too many reinforcements in the south to completely rout, but in the end, I still got all the main side objectives in time, while getting plenty of kills for the likes of Lowen, Elliwood, and Urk. Overall, a pretty tight experience, with a lot of ground to cover in spite of not a lot of units, but we can look forward to our cast expanding in the next chapter, with some particularly important units for the marathon joining our cause. Sacred Stones Erika continues her journey to Grotto, passing through the ancient forest Zaha, where we encounter our first terrors. The monk archer leaves the mage loot in their village to drive away the terrors, and joins forces with Erika to fight the monsters. Archer's light magic isn't inherently effective against terrors, but it eventually can be, and he hits the monsters pretty hard even without effectivity, as Archer is <laughs> kind enough to demonstrate. Our goal is to rout, but the map is really small, so it's still plausible to have Seth, or even Franz, just charge forward and sweep all the monsters with high HP, but little to no defenses. But as always, we don't need to do this, so I take this chapter to spread out kills between Erika, Vanessa, Ross, and Naomi. Archer starts us off, weakening a revenant for Vanessa to kill, where she sets to counter the incoming moguls on the enemy phase. Most terrors are reminiscent of assorted infantry classes, but moguls are pretty unique, being akin to a flying mage. Still, they're not very strong, and Vanessa is easily able to one round them on the enemy phase. Meanwhile, everyone else sticks together in the west, with Seth breaking the snag and Erika setting up a kill for Naomi. Erika narrowly survives, before joining Archer in the east to fight the reinforcement Bonewalkers. Franz and Kolm clear out the enemies by the bridge in the west, with Seth running forward. After another close enemy phase in the east, some allied units, including Lara Shell, make an appearance to establish that they exist, before immediately leaving. At least when Seth visits the southwestern village turn 3 and recruits Loot though, Loot is here to stay. Loot makes for our second mage this chapter, and the two make for an interesting duo, with Archer being speedy but typically short of one rounding, while Loot gets a ton of magic but doesn't double as much. They each have their uses and could both be used, but this run I'm choosing to make the most of Loot. She can pick up kills just fine in the southern area, but her starting position is not very favorable to getting many kills before the map is over, especially since I sent the too powerful Seth down to recruit her. Still, it takes some time to fight the reinforcements from the northeast, so I'm able to put together a few kills for loot, getting her started on her journey to excellence. Unfortunately, I feel this chapter is a representation of how mages fit in with Sacred Stones, in that they certainly have their strengths, but they don't stand out from physical combat enough to warrant their downsides. Enemy quality is generally low in Sacred Stones, and this chapter takes it to the extreme, with the low defensive values making physical units able to have just as high, if not higher, damage output because of weapon might. There's definitely more nuance in enemy composition and stats as the game progresses, but I'm under the impression that Sacred Stones doesn't have a ton of matchups that specifically favor mages, which is an issue when considering that their downsides still exist. Loot and Arthur have to be careful not to get two shot, something that many trained physical units don't have to deal with. 1-2 range doesn't feel special when you can just buy a ton of javelins and hand axes so early on. The magic system, or rather the impact of magical combat, is still solid in of itself, but to me it just doesn't stand out enough to encourage players to fully engage in magical strategies. At least something Sacred Stones adds is the Slayer skill for bishops, which essentially gives Archer and the clerics monster effectivity upon promotion, and absolutely gives mages an edge in damage against the many monster-heavy maps of the mid and late game. 
Still, we don't quite have Slayer yet, and I'm honestly not confident we ever will, depending on my promotion choices. So for now, I'll just have to be satisfied with the pretty standard implementation of magic. The end of the map is a bit awkward, as I'm left with just the boss on the final turn. I had planned to just have Loot get some spare kills in the south, while Franz would set up the boss kill for Vanessa on the same turn I finished the Northwestern reinforcements. However, I mindlessly sent Vanessa to support the Northwestern group, putting her out of range of reaching the boss. Rather than having Franz get the kill on the enemy phase, I just had him way out of range. Of course, in doing so, I was able to set up the boss kill for Loot, which uh, was totally my goal all along, demonstrating my superior intellect. Yeah, let's go with that. Path of Radiance Grail may be gone, but Ike rises to the occasion and takes command of the Grail mercenaries. Shannon and Gatry ran off, but Titania and the rest of our allies resolve to support Ike. A sweet sentiment, but what's even sweeter is unlocking the base. At long last, we can manage inventories, shop, and distribute bonus experience. At this point, we could give any unit a huge boost with all the bonus XP we've collected, but like Radiant Dawn, I think I'll prefer to distribute it in small amounts every chapter, and perhaps to boost someone to promotion. Leaving the base, Ike sees that our fort is surrounded by Dayan soldiers, setting up for our second defend map. Mist shows off her cool and mysterious medallion, waiting inside, but Ike's off to fend off the soldiers. We have 8 turns to defend the fort, and while there's no fog of war like Chapter 5, we do have 3 paths to defend, akin to what we saw on Blazing Blade. Looking to the west, we see the return, or rather, introduction, of the Thunder Mage Ileana. We need Ike to recruit her, so I have him follow Boyd to the west, with Boyd taking the first turn to weaken the knights, then both taking the two tile choke point turn two. Titania takes the first turn to clear out some of the cavalry in the south, before switching to block off the eastern path and its many knights, with Oscar taking her place. Ike and Boyd did really well in clearing out their enemies, and with Soren around to pick off kills, I was clear to talk to Ileana turn three. Much like in Radiant Dawn, I get the impression that she doesn't particularly excel in any one area, but if we give her a couple of slight pushes, she should be able to double enemies while hitting hard. Since I've already trained Soren and he's gotten great level ups, the two end up looking statistically very similar. Still, I love mages, so I continue training both, with Soren running back to get kills in the east, but Ileana sticks around to finish off enemies in the west, immediately one-rounding the Iron Blade Myrmidon. From there, Ike and Boyd run to the south to finish the cavalry and approach the boss group, soon joined by Titania, who would clear out the archers with a hand axe and set up night kills for Soren. Oscar joined Ileana in the west, helping her against some reinforcements from the north, while Mia and Soren took time to finish clearing enemies in the east. A lot of moving around, but in the end, it worked out, as I got to ensure I could kill most of the enemies in the north while also dealing with the boss group in the south. Boyd waited in range of the boss to get some damage off, getting an epic hammer kill on the following turn. There were a few enemies scattered across the map that I couldn't secure kills on, but I got all the droppable items and more experience than I would have gotten from just waiting at the choke points, so I'm ultimately satisfied. We're supposed to feel like this is a losing battle anyways, with Ike feeling completely worn down after our 8 turns are up. However, the Lugus, Leth, and Mordecai come to our aid and inform Ike that the King of Gallia wishes to speak with him. After receiving our battle summary from Soren, Leth and Mordecai guide us to their king, but we encounter more Dayan soldiers at Fort Titana. Our goal is to retake the castle in the southwest, but there are also some villages across the beach in the north, which some brigands will eventually threaten. Leth and Mordecai are here to aid us, but only as a yellow army, which we can give a select amount of commands. Upon starting the battle, Ike grudgingly allows the persistent younger siblings Mist and Rolf to fight alongside us. Fittingly, these two are quite weak at level 1. Mist gives us our second cleric, which may be situationally useful, but I don't plan to have Mist be an integral part of the team. Rolf, on the other hand, is an archer, and though his combat is unideal at base, he can certainly pick up kills, and that's good enough for what I have planned. First things first, I set Leth and Mordecai's AI to wait. Sorry, but you two would just get in the way. I send most everyone alongside the southern path, except Titania and Boyd, who go north through the beach. Ike, Soren, Ileana, and Oscar can do solid damage against the various enemies in the south, but don't quite one round, giving plenty of opportunities for Rolf kills. Titania and Boyd do one round the fighters and mages on the beach, 
which is great for quickly pushing forward. Unfortunately, Boyd sometimes has to rely on the Steel Axe, and his hit rates are tragically low, so he sometimes has to get two rounds and use vulneraries to stay safe. I also forgot that Titania would get slowed down by the terrain, so the two didn't exactly storm the beach as intended, but they did well enough to fend off the brigands. The south went incredibly well, with the mages doubling the knights and just generally being able to set up kills for each other and Rolf while avoiding counterattacks. The magic system in the Tellius duology is again more so just about magical combat, and as Ileana and Soren have demonstrated so far, it seems to be just fine. Nothing particularly outstanding, but it at least hits enemies like knights hard while physical units would struggle. And I've certainly had to use mages with caution, making defensive formations to block them off on numerous occasions. I've heard mages in Path of Radiance can eventually have some enemy phase presence with dodge tanking, kind of like I observed for Thracia, but like Sacred Stones, enemy quality is relatively low, and there are accurate 1-2 range options that strong physical units like Titania and Boyd can wield, making mages feel a bit less special in that regard. Something that Path of Radiance expands upon is effectivity. While I wasn't sure about mana key effectivity in the Arcanea games, I know for certain that each of the elements in the Tellius games is effective against a different Laguz type. This fits in well with Laguz being a prominent feature of the Tellius games specifically, but it's held back from feeling particularly impactful due to weapon effectivity only having a damage multiplier of 2 rather than 3, and the general low might of tomes. The elemental magic triangle is back, but I feel more than ever that it just doesn't really come into play much in the Tellius games. Overall, a pretty standard incorporation of magic in effect so far, but our mages should feel a bit more exciting as we encounter enemy Lagoos, and hopefully find ways to stack a void. Near the end of the battle, the Pegasus Knight Marsha shows up and chases after Ike, who recruits her just as I've set up a formation to fight the boss group. I'd like to say that my efforts in saving her back in Chapter 3 were worth it, but Marsha is actually not going to contribute anything of value to the playthrough, with no use for a weak Pegasus Knight at this point in the chapter, and me not having any plans for her going forward. At least she can cheer on Rolf as he finishes up the remaining enemies in the south. Boyd and Titania just barely made it to the villages in the north before the reinforcement brigands did, and they were actually able to get all the kills, just in time for Rolf to kill the boss and clear the path for Ike to seize. With that out of the way, Ike finally makes it to Galia Castle. The king expresses that Alencia cannot actually stay in Galia, and puts Ike in charge of escorting Alencia to the Kingdom of Benyon instead. It seems our journey with Alencia is not over yet, but with our new allies, I have full confidence that we can shoot down any future challenges. Radiant Dawn Having won the battle at Terran, the Liberation Army starts gaining momentum against Benyon, who is colluding with Dan. To match their strength, Makaya sets her sights on various prison camps to free and recruit more soldiers. At the base, I unequip Resolve on Makaya in favor of Paragon to double her XP gain, with our other unpromoted units not having enough skill capacity for it. I also finally give Ileana the Spirit Dust I bought back in Chapter 5, as she is clearly not going to cap magic before promoting at this rate. With that done, Makaya moves out to the Umono prison camp. Our goal is to seize it in the northeast, but we'll get more bonus experience for breaking prisoners out of their cells, and even more for escorting them to their escape point in the northwest. I send all of my army north to start. The enemies are still a bit tricky to safely defeat with our weaker units, but Soth is able to set up the soldier kill for Iran, while Jill blocks off the Mirrodon. This makes a safe path for everyone else to start running up the stairs to the center of the map, with Ileana getting shoved into range of a knight on enemy phase. She's just barely short of doubling, and surviving for that matter, but she has the next turn to finish off the kill. Turn 2, some allies show up in the east, including the tiger Morum and raven Vika, led by the fire sage Tormod. Morum and Vika have to deal with Lagu's gauge, but start transform this chapter, and have very competent combat to compensate. As a promoted mage, Tormod himself is quite strong too, and bulky enough to live a couple hits against these early game enemies. He also boasts the skill Celerity for plus 2 movement, which doesn't mean much in this more enclosed map, but should be pretty useful in the future. I have to let them roam free for a turn while Soth makes his way to Tormod, but my army still has plenty to do, with Makaya and Ileana finishing off the knights, Aron finishing the Myrmidon, and Velug heading up to clear the northwest. He doesn't actually have the best matchup against them, but he does well in setting up future kills for Aron. 
By turn 3, Soth is able to reach Tormod, recruiting his whole group. I would still prefer kills to go to my other unpromoted units, but I'm at least willing to let Tormod get some action, eventually finding the mages above the ledge to the east, clearing the way for our Lagoos to break the easternmost cell. Meanwhile, Makaya, Ileana, and Leonardo face the enemies in the center one by one, with avoiding counterattacks being very crucial to ensure no one gets two shot. On the way, they broke out the prisoners in the western cells, who started moving towards their escape point once Falug, Oran, and Nolan made enough headway in clearing out the nearby enemies. I ended up being a bit overcautious with Makaya's group, as some enemies don't appear to move, but the timing still worked out for everything to wrap up at about the same time. Soth got two attempts to pick up the coin and make it to the hidden master seal in the northeast, and the western and northern prisoners all reached their escape point. I was certainly unsatisfied with leaving the eastern prisoners on the map, but I actually got more bonus experience for reaching the lowest turn floor, so after Ileana got the boss kill, I just went ahead and seized. Makaya continues to rescue soldiers from prison camps across Benyon, but Jared and the corrupt senators take note, setting up a trap for Makaya. A mass execution of prisoners is announced to occur at Shifu Swamp, where our enemies plan to ambush our army. But first, a quick trip back to the base. I forge another Thunder Tome for Ileana, this time with more hit and not as much might, as well as by an Olivigrass. These are relatively rare, but very useful in charging half of a Lagoos gauge, and transforming our Lagoos as soon as possible will be relevant starting this very chapter. Makaya heads to the swamps, and it turns out we're actually the ones to ambush the Benyan soldiers, with Nalia, Velug, and Raphael showing up in the northwest, and Tormod's group appearing in the south. With Makaya's army in the center, we're all set to defeat the enemies scattered across the map while protecting the many allied units stuck in the swamp. Nalia's group starts strong in the northwest, demolishing their nearby enemies. Velug is certainly strong, but Nalia's stats are… <laughs> something else, holding up to be incredibly strong all the way through endgame. Raphael is also incredibly strong in his own way, with his Heron's Galder skill refreshing all adjacent allies, like Sylvia and Genealogy. I have him stay back with Nalia to speed up their kills, but in retrospect I'd prefer to have had him go immediately east to speed up Micaiah's group. Tormod does well in sweeping basically the entire southern areas on his own, while Vika uses an Olivigrass to be set to transform and swoop in to protect the prisoners at any given moment. In contrast, Makaya's group continues to carefully put together kills while avoiding counterattacks, and Soth takes the lead in an attempt to wrap around and reach the boss group as soon as possible. While we won't always have Soth as our lead unit, he certainly reflects how Radiant Dawn can take away the encouragement to utilize magical combat. Given the inclusion of Soth, Torneo, and now Nalia, I can go ahead and spoil that Radiant Dawn will continue to provide us with incredibly overpowered units. Most just have really strong physical combat that kills everything, and many still get access to 1-2 range, which really lessens the need for strong magical attackers that need to be protected. So far, Part 1 has actually been a very strong showing for mages, with the army being strong enough to take a couple hits, but still weak enough to encourage the player to rely on maximizing the offense of units like Micaiah and Ileana. Between the high resistance that even generals get later on, and the low might of tomes, I suspect that the strengths of magical combat will only feel worse as the game progresses, though its drawbacks will remain. Like Path of Radiance though, Radiant Dawn features effectivity for its elemental magic against the Lagoos. We didn't have Tormod around for the Beast Lagoos chapter earlier, but we'll eventually get to some chapters where our mages will have three times effectivity against powerhouses with low resistance. This will absolutely make for some volatile damage outputs, in which protecting, say, Ileana will pay off in destroying tough enemies. Of course, Tawny's Cavalry and Knight effectivity has already given us many such situations, and I hope that training Makaya with Paragon lets her continue to be an emblematic mage. This map though, Makaya seems to be a bit too far back to do anything truly impressive. I have Soth instigate the boss group by turn 4, and Vika flies in to protect the citizens. In order to reach the lowest turn count for maximum bonus experience, I need to win in the next couple turns, and my non-Soth units are really lagging behind. However, I also want Soth to retreat to pick up a hidden arm scroll, so after he clears out most of the boss group, I have Vika kill the priest, use Kanto to get out of range, and Micaiah and Ileana get to handle the boss. I can't set up a player phase kill, but both have enough resistance to take two hits, and I'm able to set up a kill for enemy phase. Makaya did need to dodge one hit since she got doubled, but because she did, the boss attacked into Ileana, getting her all the way to level 20. 
Her future performance is still up in the air, but she's certainly been a strong contributor so far, and I look forward to seeing how she does, wherever that may be. Shadow Dragon Mechadon soldiers are closing in on Aurelis, and Marth makes it just in time to reunite with Hardin and the Princess Nina. Once again, we'll have to make our way across the bridge to reach them in the west, while Marth needs to go north to visit the village and recruit Windle before wrapping back around to the seas point in the west. The knights are still looking pretty threatening, so I forged a plus 5 might fire for Merrick in hopes of securing one round without Excalibur. Other than that, we're set to start the battle, and Hardin and his cavalry make their appearance in the southwestern corner, guarded by mountains. My review for the Cavaliers is largely the same, with Hardin being pretty strong, but Roche and Byland not standing out much from our pre-existing Cavaliers. On the other hand, I see that the Horsemen, Wolf, and Sedgur have sword access, giving them some much appreciated flexibility. Again, I like Wolf the most, so I'll use the others when necessary, but the focus is on getting kills to Wolf. Hardin's cavalry heads to their mountain choke point in the north, while Kane draws over the enemy cavaliers in the east. In using an unforged Iron Lance, he sets up a kill for Gordon and Merrick, but I then realize that, unlike FE1, only the cavaliers moved, and the rest of Wendell's group was stationary. This made me panic for a moment, trying to think of how to safely get Wendell moving and talk to Marth on enemy phase, while keeping Marth on his path to the village and castle. I decided to just have Kane draw them over and figure it out later, switching my focus on the west for a moment. In FE1, my cavalry had to hold a choke point for a couple turns, but because we have the might of Pegasus Lena on their side, I was able to pull off a turn 2 player phase sweep, with Shida, Lena, and Wolf killing the archers while making a formation that kept everyone safe on the enemy phase. After surviving in the west and successfully getting the northeastern group to move, I had Marth visit the village for the Firestone, then had everyone else run away, in hopes of Wendell being able to reach Marth on the following enemy phase. However, I realized that apparently Merrick can just talk to Wendell, which made the situation a lot less stressful. Like FE1, I don't plan to use Wendell going forward, but I recognize that his high stats and staff rank can definitely have their value. With the eastern half taken care of, it's now just up to the cavalry and Pegasus knights to finish up the enemy knights and thieves in the west. I use the mountains to hold another choke point for a turn, but since it'll take a set amount of turns to have Marth walk his way to the seas point and Merrick get to the boss, it doesn't actually waste any time. While rushing Mark to the Western Knights felt pretty important in FE1, overcoming them, even without Merrick and Shadow Dragon, made me realize that magical combat might not be so strong in the remake. As proven by Lena, any physical units can destroy even knights with the Big Forge. Additionally, enemies seem more difficult to double, I think because they aren't getting weighed down anymore, so I suspect you'd have to have a particularly high speed set to double now. Fire Tomes also have low durability, so a strong Fire Forge would be both expensive and short-lived. Their flexible range still feels strategic, and meaningful for weakening enemies while playing carefully, but going off of what I've seen from Merrick, I don't feel there are as many matchups that particularly favor magic for getting kills. Perhaps we'll get Elemental Mana Key effectivity one day, but if not, then I worry that, just like Binding Blade, magic will end up being just a weapon type with flexible but underwhelming combat. While not strictly related to magic itself, I'll quickly mention the introduction of the reclassing system, in which any units can now wield magic. From my observations though, the base magic for both individual units and the mage class are pretty low. Conceptually, reclassing could set up for some magic users with atypical stat spreads, but I feel that most every unit's reclassing into mage has an abysmal magic stat, and as I discussed, low damage output on mages is not really what I'm looking for. Perhaps Nevair will get a huge boost upon his bishop promotion and start wrecking everything, but I'm doubtful this will be the case. I do get Merrick in range to fight the boss in the end, but I was surprised to see that he no longer doubled. I suppose I could have gone for a crit, but I ultimately just had Cheetah get the one round with the wing spear. Not the ending I wanted, but I at least had been able to set up kills for other units while waiting for Marth to catch up, including Lena and Wolf. Wolf's XP gain has been surprisingly low, for reasons I'll realize and explore next part. In the moment though, I was certainly happy with this performance, and I'm very much so looking forward to seeing what he can do in the future. New Mystery of the Emblem Marth is back at Home Beach, where he hopes to reunite with Ogma and the royal children of Grust. 
The map is about the same as in Mystery of the Emblem, starting in the southwest, with a path to the seas point in the southeast wrapping around a mountain. There are also villages in the southwest and northeast corners, theoretically making for some tedious backtracking, but again, our new allies are here to help with this. Upon starting the map, Ogma shows up in the northeast with the royal children Yulia and Yubello. Even on hard mode, the mercenary Ogma still does well in protecting the children from the nearby pirates and hunters. The cleric Yulia thankfully keeps her infinite range rescue, and the mage Yubello keeps the desperate need for a training arc, which I will be all too happy to provide him. I am even happier, though, to have Ogma recruit the nearby paladin, Sirius. New Mystery may now be cutting experience gain for promoted units, but this means nothing to me in the face of Sirius's dashing portrait, which has absolutely earned him a spot on the team. I let him stick around to clear out a hunter and some pirates, before running back to protect the village from a thief. Meanwhile, I set up a kill for Linda and the West, with Queen, Luke, and Catria each getting one round to mostly clear out the first group of enemies turn one. Marth went down to visit the southern village, then got rescued by Yulia to immediately reach the second village in the north. By then, Ogma had finished clearing up the nearby pirates, as his limited survivability made it unreasonable to intentionally avoid one rounds for the sake of Yubello kills. Regardless, the beach was clear for Ogma, Sirius, and Yubello to move south, while Marth visited the village and recruited Castor. This time, he's more comparable to our archers, with Ryan actually being stronger. Between this, limited deployment sizes, and knowing that Draco Knights are not nearly as scary in New Mystery, he won't be getting a lot of action in. Speaking of not getting a lot of action, I have the Western group push forward, but because Marth got rescued, they easily miss out on the boss group, outside of Paula and Catria, who could fly over the mountain. Roderick does reach one pirate kill, but with only one fort around to provide reinforcements and Marth being so close to seizing, it still felt like a waste of time to move them all. Still, moving Catria and Paolo was definitely useful, as Catria was able to one-round the hunter by the boss. I set up a pirate kill for Yubello near the end, and I was prepared to have him kill a reinforcement on the final turn, but oddly enough they ended up attacking into Sirius, perhaps for weapon triangle advantage? Regardless, Paolo set up the boss kill for Catria, Linda stuck back to get kills against the western reinforcements, then Marth was ready to seize. All in all, a pretty simple experience, made exciting by the introduction of three important members of our team. Upon seizing, Sheeta flies in, unveiling the dire situation in Altea. Emperor Hardin conspired with Lang and struck while Marth was away, and we must now go back to reclaim Marth's homeland. First, we aim to retake Olburn Keep, which is being occupied by Lang's army. New Mystery again alleviates some of the painful elements of the map, removing the mountain tiles that would slow Marth's progress toward the village in the northwest, and there's only one ballistician in addition to the boss, which should make a more aggressive approach towards the castle more reasonable. The base also unlocks the training grounds, which essentially replaces the arena, but you don't win gold from it. I spend some money here to get Yubello an additional level, but unless we get a ton of gold in the future, I don't expect to use it too much. Perhaps the biggest change comes not from the map itself, but our own army, as I do my first new mystery reclass, switching Sirius to Draco Knight. Time to let the enemies know how it feels, I say. In addition to Shida, we actually get two new recruits, with Julian recruiting Rickard again, and Ogma now recruiting Barst. Shida is weaker than our other Pegasus Knights, but in true Shida fashion, her speed is excellent for her level, and I'll be prioritizing her over the other Pegasus Knights from now on. Rickard is a bit redundant as a second thief that I won't be training, but I suppose you never know when a large map with numerous chests and doors might show up. Barst completes our awkward recruitment of the fighter trio, made especially awkward by the fact that I won't be using any of them anyways. So thanks, but moving on, most everyone else takes the first turn to move north, with Ryan setting up the first thief kill for Yubello, while Sirius flies over the water to the west. Turn 2, Sirius is set to fly over to the Ballista, killing with the Steel Lance while staying out of range of the boss. The Cavaliers in the east didn't move unprovoked, which made chasing the Master Seal Thief a bit trickier, but it does make the mages easier to defeat, so I can set up kills for our frailer units like Yubello and Queen. Sheeta flew up the mountains in pursuit of the thief, chasing away one cavalier with a javelin, but she ended up having to deal with the two remaining cavaliers on her own, as I had sent everyone else towards the castle. Now, there wasn't really much for them to do, as Sirius incidentally swept many of the cavaliers while killing the ballista turn 2 and the boss turn 3, but it's the thought that counts. Even past then, Sirius continued to be insane, one-rounding the Draco Knights on his own with the Silver Lance long before Marth even reached past the castle. 
As epic as Sirius and Cheetah ended up being on this map, it did come at the cost of the cool Linda moments in Mystery of the Emblem, and just general usage of the mages altogether. Like Shadow Dragon, I feel the powerful Forge favors physical weapons more than tomes, and combined with the weaker Draco Knights, there was never a matchup that I felt the mages would be particularly useful in. Not to say that they're weak, with Queen even getting some one rounds, but the physical units are hitting the same enemies just as strong. Yet again, their flexible ranges persist as their main distinguishing feature to me, but I feel the encouragement to make careful use of this range is perhaps a bit too much, being so frail that they're coming close to facing Okos. <laughs> At least we've been given a couple tomes with interesting effects or stats. Though Nosferatu's capabilities are limited by the stronger enemies, it's refreshing to see tomes with effects past being a magical weapon again. Aura technically doesn't have an effect, but its massive might feels like a special effect in of itself, with the physical weapons being completely standard. Again, I'm really banking on there being some elemental mana key effectivity in the future to give magic something truly unique. Until then though, I'm fairly satisfied with the glass cannon approach that magical combat is going for, as unnecessary as this may feel when we have someone like Sirius flying around and killing everything. Having correctly manipulated enemy AI, I successfully got Cheetah to kill a thief without getting too hit KO'd, with the weaker Iron Lance Cavalier blocking the Silver Sword one. Sirius then joined her in the north, waiting just outside of the sniper's range. Marth reached the village with just a few turns of walking past the castle this time, and once again earned us the Hermern. This time, I'm correct in assuming we can Hermern the rescue staff, so I immediately had Yulia rescue Marth back to the seize points. Just before having Marth seize, Sirius flew up to a bishop that had been spamming physic throughout the map and got the one round. Only five uses left, but hey, I got it. At the very least, it was a power play, and shows that I will no longer live in fear of whatever challenges Mystery of the Emblem may throw at me. Awakening While we wait to request more aid from Regna Ferox, Queen accompanies Krom for the night, and Krom divulges the backstory of how his sister came to be a symbol of peace for Plagia. He's interrupted, however, by the masked Marth, who claims to have seen the future and warns against an assassination attempt on his sister. They're proven to be correct, but in doing so has their mask broken and is revealed to be female. Of course, we understand now this is not Marth, but the characters don't know this, and we move right along to our mission, protecting Emerin from enemies led by the sorcerer Valdar. Well, the victory condition is to rout, as always, and rather than playing on the defensive, we have the power to just go fully aggressive. Valdar seems to recognize Queen, but we'll have to wait until later to get answers. The map splits our army in two, with each handling their respective path to the south, and we need to send someone to help our ally Marth guard a path to Emerin in the center. Looking around, we also see the thief Gaius in the west, but we'll have to wait a turn to recruit him. Until then, I have Muriel one round a fighter from across a wall with Queen's pair up, also weakening the nearby Dark Mage on enemy phase. Fake pairs up with Longku, and the two go off to fight off the fighters and thieves coming from the center, with Maribel ferrying Rickon over from the east to assist him. Kellum pairs up with Stahl, letting him tank the physical enemies in the eastern path, handling the dark mages by two-shotting with a javelin and healing with a vulnerary. Turn 2, the Tegel Pene shows up in the north. Her physical combat is pretty strong, but I'll mostly be utilizing her for her pair-up stats going forward, boosting the strength and speed of a unit we'll recruit in the near future. We also get to recruit Gaius this turn, who boasts high speed in addition to his thief utility. While his base offense isn't spectacular, I do have great plans for him, so I get started in training him right away, taking the Dark Mage kill that Muriel set up. The rest of the battle is basically about setting up kills for Gaius in the west, while Anku sweeps the center and Stahl pushes forward in the east. Gaius is pretty frail though, so he'll be getting most of his survivability in the early game through relying on dodges, made reasonable when paired with Krom. When the Cavaliers approach, though, I have him retreat, killing the remaining Thief and Dark Mage across the wall with Queen and Muriel, and set up a choke point with Krom and Panay. Unfortunately, the Cavaliers target Panay, and she one rounds both with Krom's dual strike, but Panay's experience is technically still helpful, so it's fine. Attacking through walls isn't necessarily unique to magic, but it is an additional use for its 1-2 range. It's ironic that it's shining and awakening of all games this part, which is known for its more open maps. It's not as if magical combat isn't still useful in Awakening, quite the opposite in fact. Awakening features playable characters with really high growths, and while our experience with Muriel has been reflective of mages in the past, Queen is already showing us the potential of magical combat tied to a unit with huge stats. 
We've occasionally used her to weaken enemies at range for other units, but we've also seen how she can pair with Krom, move in range of multiple enemies, and come out on top, regardless of the composition. Essentially, Awakening shows us what happens if the strengths of magical combat aren't properly balanced by some form of drawback, with solid defense values, dual guards, and eventually Nosferatu for dark mages, taking away the frailty that mages are typically given. This gives us the opposite issue of some previous games like Binding Blade and Radiant Dawn, where the context of its units and enemy stats made magical combat feel underwhelming. However, Awakening's huge stats also apply to physical units, who also get access to solid 1-2 range options. Tomes are also just a weapon type with largely standard options outside of Nosferatu, so I can't say magic feels all that special. That being said, it is kind of fun to explore how crazy magical combat can be for at least one game, and it absolutely fits with Awakening's design of putting together powerhouses that sweep large groups of enemies. I know Muriel and Rickon aren't representing that now, but trust me, we'll get there one day. After picking up a few kills, Gaius gets transfer chained over to the chest near Emerin, while Stahl draws over Valdar in the south. Stahl's low resistance meant he had to retreat, drawing Valdar closer to Longku. Like last chapter, I could have saved a turn with a bit of foresight, perhaps forging a strong Iron Lance to let Stahl kill Valdar on turn 5 player phase, but I'm ultimately satisfied with setting up the kill for Longku instead, with which he reaches level 10. I haven't decided if I want to start using promotion and reclassing items just yet, but next part promises to be critical in building the team regardless, with plenty of paralogs, new units, and training arcs to come. Fates. Birthright. On her journey to find Takumi and Ryoma, Queen passes through the Eternal Stairway, where we encounter a group of Faceless. It turns out this was one of Iago's illusions, and we actually just destroyed innocent members of the Wind Tribe, leading us to a full-scale battle with the Wind Tribe, led by Fuga. He's placed at the far north, but there are also enemies scattered about that we must rout. The desert terrain slows us down, but there are a couple dragon veins we can use to create plane tiles. The map also features some new allies for Queen to recruit in the southwest, Hinoka, alongside her retainers, Satsuna and Azama. At the end of the last chapter, we also got three new units. Saizo complements Kaze as our second ninja, being strong and bulky, but a bit slow. Orochi is a traditional mage, or rather, diviner, with high magic but low defenses. Silas is about the same as in Conquest, but has higher weapon ranks here, which lets him already use the javelin. Of these three, I'll be using Orochi the most in Birthright, though Silas and Saizo will certainly get their fair share of action in the other routes. Before sending Queen to recruit Hinoka's group, I want to pair her with Kaze for the first turn, so that he can sweep some enemies in the north and guarantee that they get maximum support points. Because magical units don't face any movement penalty from the desert, Sakura can trigger the first Dragon Vein right away, letting everyone else team up to get the kills in the immediate area using each other's dual strikes. Azura then sings for Kaze so that he can get in range of a few Diviners and Samurai in the north. He looks way overkill on damage, but this will be useful later, once we start fighting the bulky Oni Savages, and eventually, Fuga. I don't want Hinoka's group to get caught up in any fights, so I do some transferring to get Queen to talk to Hinoka turn 2, while still ending up paired with Kaze in the north. As a royal, Hinoka is given a lot of strong traits, with amazing speed, C-rank lances, and the personal skill Rallying Cry that gives a plus 2 damage buff to allies within 2 spaces. Setsuna and Azama are a bit less flashy. Setsuna is a low-level archer that gets amazing speed but low offense, and while Azama has great physical stats, he starts as a monk. Of the three, I plan for Hinoka and Setsuna to be used the most, with Hinoka getting off to an interesting start, teaming up with Jacob, and making use of Rallying Cry, Shuriken debuffs, and Dual Strikes to just barely get the kills in the west. Meanwhile, Setsuna goes back east, where I have everyone teaming up together to get all the kills in the center of the map. We've only just gotten our first mage, but I can confirm that Orochi is pretty reflective of future mages and birthright. Magic does hit enemies like Oni Savages and Knights particularly hard, and you generally have to keep them out of enemy range. However, this is just the starting point for magical combat, as the reclassing system, skills, pair-up, and tonics give plenty of room for boosting the combat of mages. This is similar to Awakening, and does generally result in units that can walk forward and sweep groups of enemies in the late game, but I believe it feels more thoughtful in Fates, and there's no units like the Avatar that can just naturally do it for the entire game. 
For example, putting Rinka in a class with Tome access and learning some magic boosting skills will take some planning, but it should perform very well when paired with her natural bulk and calculated stat boosting. With Fates nerfing standard 1-2 physical options like the Javelin to not have follow-up attacks, Magic's innate 1-2 range actually feels like a special strength. Also, while all the Hoshiden weapons give minor boosts, like plus 1 defense and resistance for Naginatas, the Hoshiden equivalent of tomes, scrolls, each have their own unique stat boosts. Most aren't very impactful, with the bronze equivalent Rat Spirit giving plus 1 skill, and the iron equivalent Ox Spirit giving plus 1 defense, but just by giving each scroll a unique effect, magic as a weapon type feels more mystic. In giving the player even just a little more to consider, the stat boosts also make the gameplay a bit more engaging, as situational as they may be. Orochi didn't quite get to show off Magic's peak combat potential, but she was certainly useful enough in weakening enemies in the center. Kaze showed her up, using his immediately strong 1-2 range to sweep the northern area, reaching Fuga by turn 4. Now, his overkill damage comes through, thoroughly weakening Fuga, and with his newly learned Poison Strike skill, he set up the kill for Tsubaki. The last turn was still pretty tight in finishing all the enemies, especially considering that some are paired up, some don't move, and the Shrine Maidens can't attack into us. In utilizing dual strikes though, I was able to finish getting all the kills to the units I wanted on the final turn. Orochi and Setsuna still have a long way to go, but at least Kaze got all the levels and support points I wanted him to, which should have quite the fun payoff next chapter. Conquest Queen has made it past the Lost Learned Forest and discovers the Ice Tribe, who takes us in with welcome arms. Elise spoils that we are actually here to suppress them, and we quickly find ourselves at arms with their leader Kilma, our old maid Flora, and their currently available soldiers. There are villages scattered across the map, and if an enemy lancer reaches them first, they will alert even more soldiers to join the field. If we visit, then no enemies will spawn, and we get the maximum reward after the battle for visiting at least three. Our ultimate goal is just to defeat Kilma in the northwest and seas, but as we'll soon see, I have other priorities. To start us off, Silas and Elise carry our group west. Effie visits the first village, and in ignoring the northern villages, I should at least be able to secure the western two in time. Going west also lets us meet up with some very important allies that show up turn two, Leo's edgy retainers, Odin and Niles. Niles will eventually let us capture enemies like Orochi, and being a speedy bow user will certainly be helpful, but I am much, much more excited about recruiting Odin. He is just so adorable, and he brings a lot of cool contributions as a dark mage. I sadly won't be going for the Vantage Oko build that lets him sweep the entire game, but I do have some fun plans for him. As such, the focus of this map is to have him get as many kills as possible while still keeping a fast pace. To assist in this challenge, Queen passes him some tonics and a fire tome. Training Odin will have to wait a turn, though, as I need him to ferry Niles to the west, and upon Elise triggering the Dragon Vein to unfreeze the lake, the enemy Dark Mages are all forced to attack into Niles at 2 range, who one rounds them all. This clears the way for Jacob to weaken Flora turn 3, setting up the kill for Silas, all while having stayed out of her freeze range the previous turn. With Korn getting transferred to Silas, he's able to one round the nearby fighters turn 3. Meanwhile, Niles runs back to fight some Dark Mages approaching from the east on enemy phase, using the Bronze Bow for accuracy and to let Odin get dual strikes in without taking the kill. This sets up for a turn 4, where Silas can visit the westernmost village, and Odin can wait in range of the weakened mages to get multiple kills in one turn. With Odin being statistically well-rounded rather than excelling in magic like Orochi, his combat starts out fairly underwhelming, but Niles' outlaw pair-up and a speed tonic lets him at least start doubling, and he's bulky enough to live a couple hits when necessary. After securing three villages and dealing with a few enemies that move unprovoked from the east, we're technically fine to just approach Kilma and complete the map. However, I'm not quite done with training Odin just yet, and I circle around in a counterclockwise path so I can fully route. The next group we fight is a mix of some enemies from the eastern and northern villages. I lead with Jacob paired with Silas, who clears out a dark mage and weakens a fighter. This makes for a pretty tense follow-up turn, as I need to kill two fighters and two dark mages, while also being cautious of even more enemies that are now just a bit away in the northwest. The Ice Pillar makes for some nice defensive terrain though, and I'm able to put together these four kills while keeping my weakened units out of enemy range. And of course, all the while, I made sure to not just have Odin use his player phase to get a kill, 
but I also utilized his dual strikes whenever possible, which was a mix of being genuinely useful and also a way to secure more experience and weapon rank. The inclusion of consistent dual strikes in Fates is something that further adds to the impact of 1-2 range, aka tomes. This is true in Birthright, of course, but I do feel that Conquest specifically features many moments where getting to utilize dual strikes to push for damage on player phase while having flexible positioning is useful. Outside of some tedious calculations that dual strikes can encourage the player to make, I think they're a good balance of being strong but also feeling tactical, and it synergizes really well with mages being about meaningful positioning with a strong payoff. Fates also includes tomes in its weapon triangle, alongside bows and its new weapon type, shurikens, rather than having a separate elemental triangle for magic. This does strengthen its place as just another weapon type, and not really its own system, but in effect I think it actually allows for mages to be more engaging to use. Magic triangles were never all that impactful, but Odin getting weapon triangle advantage against all the axe-wielding fighters on this map is certainly nice. It also strengthens the existence of certain class matchups, such as Tomes having the advantage on the high defense, low resistance Oni Savages, and disadvantage against the high resistance Pegasus Knights. Conquest's Tomes may not have special boosts like Scrolls, but to be honest, Conquest already gives you a lot to engage with, and I feel the higher hit rates of Tomes actually works better with Conquest. Now, we do actually get one tome with a unique effect, Nosferatu, which absolutely gives Dark Mages a unique combat role. Overall, Tomes in Conquest may just be a weapon type that only stands out with its 1-2 range and magical combat, but I honestly think that this works just fine in effect, with magical combat certainly having a strong, thoughtful place in the game. Having routed the Ice Tribe soldiers, Odin has already reached level 8, and Silas has reached D-Lances. I run Odin back to finish a Lancer that has been distracted in the south this entire time, while the rest of the army gets set up to fight Kilma. He's quite tough, standing on the gate and having the Vantage Nosferatu combo that makes finishing him off difficult. I attempted to set up the kill for Odin in spite of all of this, but Silas proved to be too strong, taking the kill after Jacob weakened Kilma on enemy phase, and Kilma missing his 84 hit Nosferatu that would have healed him. Of course, I love Silas too, so I'm okay with this outcome. Not the fastest possible clear in the end, but I'm pretty happy with it considering my goals, and Odin will absolutely appreciate the boost going forward. Revelation Having made it back to Hoshido, Queen begins her journey to rally together our allies, starting at Fort Jinya. In choosing to side with neither army, we have apparently become a traitor to both. The Hoshiden tactician, Yukimura, reveals that Takumi has been captured by Nor and Ryoma is missing, and we must fight our way through the fort to defeat him and resolve our conflict. The layout is the same as in Birthright, but our army of four starts in the south this time. Yukimura is set at the north of the fort, guarded by Orochi and Saizo, and it'll take some time to wind around the fort to reach them while also picking up the chests. The enemies on the outside provide some pressure, but otherwise we can take our time in our approach. No one in our army really needs training though, so I buff up Queen and Jacob with tonics, ready to sweep everything. Starting off, Jacob weakens the first Oni Savage, letting Queen get the kill with a Dragonstone. The Dragonstone again is very important, helping Queen survive in spite of the massive player to enemy count disadvantage, while just barely picking up some Okos with dual strikes. With Azura to sing for her, Queen can start heading to the chest room, and Gunter helps her kill the Samurai turn 1. With enemies approaching from the south, and an enemy samurai that Azura drew over from the east, I continue pushing to the chest room, where I can take a few turns to fight the enemies at the choke point, while Gunter gets the chest. I pair Jacob with Queen here so he can get into the chest room faster and fight the archer, and Azura pairs up with Gunter to escape the samurai, but this does effectively take me from having 4 actions to 2. I generally try to keep units unpaired in fates when possible to avoid this issue, but it's especially rough here, where we already have so few units. Still, leaving Jacob and Queen paired, let's Jacob one round the Sky Knights as they approach the chest room, and they're able to break out and continue their path north after a couple turns regardless. Jacob has to two round the Spear Fighters and takes a lot of damage from them, but Liv to serve lets him heal both Azura and himself before he and Queen start wrapping their way back to the north. During this time, Azura reaches level 10 and learns Inspiring Song. This gives her singing target a plus 3 buff to speed, skill, and luck, and while it's not particularly relevant right now, it'll absolutely be helpful in pushing units to doubling thresholds at various points in time throughout all three routes. After I leave the chest room, a ninja actually shows up in the south, aiming to steal the chest, but as Gunter has already retrieved it, they immediately escape. 
This was a bit silly, but ultimately meant that I'm free to continue moving forward without protecting Azura, getting Jacob and Queen to unpair as they fight through the Oni Savages, Ninjas, and Archers in the center of the fort. I think this chapter vaguely shows how much well-balanced magical combat can make gameplay more fun, even if the map can be beaten without it. The Dragonstone technically counts as magic, but has a completely separate appeal than traditional tomes, given its one range and defensive buffs. When a unit can just walk forward and kill everything, strategies just aiming to win become very stale. Of course, just giving the player a mage doesn't solve this on its own. If we had recruited Orochi for this map, it wouldn't really change much, as Queen and Jacob could still just stomp the enemies on the charge to the north. That being said, our army will expand and maps will get more engaging as the game continues, and I think that magical combat overall still has a fun place in Revelation. In fact, Revelation enemies are notably stronger than in Birthright and Conquest, and hitting enemies on their lower resistance stat feels very meaningful when physical units are doing, uh, let's just say, not very much, as we'll see in the next chapter. The cool interactions between Magic and Fates' other systems, like reclassing and dual strikes, also still apply, and while we haven't gotten any mages in our team yet, this chapter does give us a glimpse at some units that will be very strong magical contributors in the future, which I'm excited to show off. After winding their way through the fort, Queen and Jacob draw over Orochi and Saizo, with Azura handedly taking them out. Jacob weakens Tsukimura on enemy phase, while Queen goes south to open the second chest. On the final turn, Azura sings for her to reach Yukimura, doubling thanks to inspiring song, and easily setting up the kill for Jacob. After the battle, Saizo shows off his pyrotechnics and threatens to take us all out, but thankfully Sakura and Kaze are able to calm him down. Yukimura's group leaves, but Kaze, Sakura, and her retainers all join us, giving us a long-awaited boost to our army. <sighs> Finally. Shadows of Valentia. Act 2, The Pilgrimage The bells of the Priory ring for a new day, a new dawn, a new era. At last, we now switch to the perspective of our best protagonist, Selica. Since we last saw her in the prologue, she's been hidden away in the Priory. Recently, the lands have become barren and terrors run amok, so Selica sets out to find the goddess Mila to restore the state of Sophia and save her people. The path to Mila Temple will be a long one, with pirates ruling the seas, but Selica is joined by the mages May and Bowie, along with the cleric, Jenny. Just as in Gaiden, Selica will be our leading force to start, with solid stats all around and getting an attack and speed fountain. She can use both magic and swords, which Shadows of Valentia highlights with a new golden dagger. Again, May is more focused on speed and attack and starts with thunder, while Bowie gets more defense and a slightly earlier promotion. Both will be useful, but the star of our starting cast will be Jenny, who I again give the final speed fountain. Before we can set sail, we must first travel through the terror-filled Novus Cemetery. Shadows of Valentia has only added two slightly stronger revenants, so it is still effectively just a training ground to show off our magical starting cast. This time, Selica specifically calls out how magic ignores terrain effects, with the forests and graves here working completely in our favor. Speaking of hit rates, Nosferatu's base hit being brought up to 60 makes the upcoming maps a lot more consistent, in which I set up as many kills for Jenny as possible. Shadows of Valentia also includes some hidden supports, in which Bowie gives Selica and Jenny 5 hits when within 3 spaces, so Jenny actually ends up having 65 hits here, as opposed to the 50 she has in Gaiden. All of our mages also benefit from the modern true hit system, which pushes hit rates above 50, closer to 100. I typically send Jenny off to fight the southern enemies on her own, in the mindset of wanting her to get as many kills as possible. However, my experience from Gaiden taught me that Jenny can actually get more experience by sticking with the other mages as they weaken enemies, and her lower defense will encourage the enemies to attack into her. I did lose a turn compared to Gaiden, as one added revenant starts further away in the northwest, but the extra turn and additional enemies made sure she got past level 2, so it all worked out. Past Novus Cemetery, we reach Novus Great Port. After exploring around for a bit, we head to the tavern to enlist the support of the mercenary Saber, in exchange for Selica's Golden Dagger. Well, because Saber joins our army, it's still in our possession, but I'll let Saber hold on to it anyways for now. He actually appreciates the attack boost, as he's fast enough to double most enemies for a while, but doesn't get to make use of spells like our mages, ironically making him weaker in effect. 
He'll get some great boosts with promotions and strong swords later on, but my focus for now is still on Salika and Jenny. With Saber recruited, we can set sail, going into our second time with the first pirate raid. Jenny takes the lead this time, thanks to the prep screen, waiting at the choke point between the boats turn 1. We now have to start working around healing AI, which is a bit frustrating, but otherwise the map goes perfectly fine. As intended, the mages get to hit the pirates from behind the choke point, with May's 3 range thunder being particularly useful. I switched to having Celica out front turn 2 in an attempt to push forward, but like Gaiden, counterattacking with swords limits her enemy phase potential. Regardless, she's able to board the enemy boat and get in range of the boss turn 3. I suppose one nice aspect to counterattacking with swords is that she isn't forced to spend HP to cast fire. I find that the HP cost for magic is typically not relevant, outside of certain spells with high enough cost that you can't use them literally every turn. Moments like this, however, often prove me wrong, and show that the HP cost works well to balance magic from being too powerful, while also making for engaging turn-by-turn -turn gameplay to work around this cost. Shadows of Valentia in particular helps this be engaging by actually letting players see the data for spells in the UI, unlike Gaiden, where I'm never fully sure how a round of combat is going to play out until it's over. We're past Gaiden though, so I'm confidently able to have Celica finish up the enemies. We immediately move on to our second pirate raid. Only one enemy has been added, but we now start seeing enemies that have had their levels raised. This makes the combat marginally more difficult, but it also means we stand to gain a lot more experience, which is great news for our magical cast, who all want just a few levels to learn their next spell. The strong mercenary, brigand boss, and archer in the northeast limits Jenny's ability to lead even with Nosferatu, so I again just have Celica up front in the east, while Saber and Bowie handle the west. This time though, I opt to have Celica move back to kill the brigand boss with fire, letting the mercenary move up front by turn 2. Celica gets an epic 6 damage crit on the mercenary, and the Bowie support and true hits really come in clutch, helping Mei and Celica land their magic attacks to finish off the mercenary. This kill earns the Leather Shield, which will help our frail mages keep an enemy phase presence, as the enemies get actually respectable attack values. Like Gaiden, I appreciate how items give the player a way to influence a mage's performance, either through mitigating their weaknesses, like shields and the HP recovery from rings, or helping them play to their strengths, like the ring effects that increase spell range. This works well with Gaiden's equipment system, meant to limit the stress of inventory management, and making the one weapon, or item in Mage's case, still feel impactful. I mostly keep the leather shield on Celica here, so she can survive while up front, but trading around items is another engaging aspect that Gaiden's weapon system allows for, and Shadows of Valentia's improved controls makes me feel a lot more comfortable pulling this off. The map ends pretty well, with our bulky Celica weakening the generic brigands for her and Jenny to kill, while Saber and Bowie finish teaming up against the brigands in the southwest. The higher enemy levels does indeed show dividends, with Celica and Jenny already reaching level 4. With this, Jenny has already learned the spell Invoke, which summons allied soldiers to fight for our cause. We don't need it this chapter, but it does demonstrate how, in providing more experience per map, Shadows of Valentia accelerates the payoff for training mages, so new spells can reasonably get unlocked every few maps or so, rather than having to really focus on just a couple of mages to unlock just a couple of spells. I feel this better supports how mages distinguish themselves from physical units in getting their promotional stat gains later, but intermittently getting immediate payoffs and more combat and utility options. Now we can train all our mages and constantly get new magical options that let us do things that units like Saber can't, while still needing to use these options strategically to work around their frailness and HP costs. So yeah, I really like how magic was incorporated in Gaiden, actually having its own system, and Shadows of Valentia makes it even better with its minor polishes. Getting a whole starting cast that interacts with the system, on top of Shadows of Valentia's more developed characters and presentation, is just so awesome, and I'm really looking forward to playing out the rest of Celica's routes, with Jenny at her side to crush the competition, of course. Three Houses the Black Eagles have suppressed Lenardo's rebellion, and we discover a letter that details an assassination attempt on the Archbishop Rhea. Suspecting that this may be some diversion, we spend our time in the monastery deciphering what our enemy's true goal may be. We are also introduced to another knight of Saros, Shamir, along with her apprentice and Rhea's strongest soldier, Cyril. 
For promotions, we just have Bernadetta going into fighter this chapter, but our efforts in the upcoming battle will set up for a ton of intermediate class promotions next chapter. In the monastery, the main feature unlocked is the training grounds. Unlike the arenas of other games, our units don't get experience for winning, but its High Professor experience reward will be very helpful in my rush for a High Professor rank. As for our mission assistant this month, I choose Annette. She won't be used in the long term, but having another unit with heal, alongside her personal Rally Strength skill, will assist the units I do want to train. I'll also highlight the results of my instructing, in which I rushed Bernadetta to C plus lances, giving her the combat art Vengeance. This boosts her damage for every point of HP she is missing, which allows for some truly absurd damage outputs, as we'll soon see. The Black Eagles are left to guard the Holy Mausoleum, where the remains of St. Seros are said to lie. It turns out this is exactly what our enemies are after, and we must fight through enemy ranks to defeat their commander before they can open Seros' tomb. In our way stands the threatening Death Knight, whose massive stats and high crit rate let him obliterate most of our units. He patrols the entire center of the map, but we are well equipped to take him out. The goal for turn 1 is to draw over the Death Knight while killing the nearby enemies, ideally getting Bernadetta's HP as low as possible in the process. We can't get too close to the Archer or Dark Mage without also being in range of the Death Knight, so I have Sylvain and Hubert weaken the Dark Mage at 3 range, using the Fusillade Gambit and Mire Spell respectively, while Edelgard takes the kill at 2 range with a Training Bow. Bernadetta weakens the Archer, getting her to exactly 1 HP, and setting up the kill for Queen. This left only Queen in range of the Death Knight, and between Rally Strength and some of the Greenhouse stat boosters, she just barely avoided getting doubled while also getting solid damage off. This was easily enough to set up the kill for Bernadetta with Vengeance. However, my goal for this chapter was to set up for intermediate class promotions next chapter, and Queen, Edelgard, and Sylvain each want a lot of experience to reach the requisite level 10. As such, I opt to set up the kill for Edelgard instead, whose massive strength lets her pick up the kill after just a few gambits. The Death Knight warps away, and we're now set to split up into a Western and Eastern team. Turn 3, I used our second stride, letting the Eastern group jump the enemies from their starting positions. Edelgard kills the Archer, and Bernadetta's curve shot safely sets up the Dark Mage kill for Sylvain. Huber joins the Eastern group, but everyone else heads west, led by Queen. Incidentally, this meant that the Eastern group had to do without any healers or professor's guidance. The experience distribution ultimately worked out, but I was cutting it a bit close in the end. Regardless, Queen does fine in leading the weaker Western group through the choke points, while the Eastern side largely relied on getting all their kills on player phase to mitigate the damage they took. While they struggled a bit in the end, they overall did just fine, with Bernadetta and Hubert's strong ranged attacks being a perfect fit for their approach. So yes, magical combat does appear to be fulfilling its typical role as an engaging alternative to physical combat. Of course, the main aspect that makes magic stand out in Three Houses is its innate spell lists. Like Gaiden, each character has their own set of spells they learn, but in Three Houses they are unlocked at certain weapon ranks rather than levels. This fits in really well with Three Houses' focus on teaching your students, and rewarding the player for training units both in and off the battlefield. It's especially impactful in the early game, when unlocking a mage's second or third spell makes a big difference in their potential performance, as we've seen with Hubert. In rushing D+, and C Reason, we've gotten relatively early access to his 3-range Mire and movement-locking Banshee spells. Speaking of Hubert, the splitting of spells into black and dark magic is a bit confusing in effect. However, I do appreciate it as a way to make certain units like Hubert feel unique even among other mages, learning spells with high might and cool effects like debuffing movement or ignoring resistance. I'll also point out that, just like Gaiden, magic ignores terrains of void in Three Houses, which helps it feel special and is just generally an appreciated boost. Now, something I'm a bit less thrilled about is the durability system. Giving spells some form of durability fits well with how Three Houses balances its offensive options. However, mages can't just be given a new spell when one breaks, so Three Houses went with the middle ground of giving spells limited uses per map. In some ways, I think this is pretty interesting, as it encourages consistent use of the fun, strong spells throughout every chapter, rather than hoarding. However, it also prevents the possibility of using a spell a ton of times in one map. I'll admit that this generally still fits under the traditional goal of magic as an engaging, rewarding player phase tool, but it does heavily restrict mage's potential for enemy phase sweeps, 
which I find to be one of the more entertaining parts of Three Houses. Still, we don't really have to worry about this awkward durability for a while, as Hubert, Dorothea, Linhart, and Annette have more than enough spell uses to get through this chapter while setting up kills for our level 10 targets. Now, things got a little out of control when the southern mage reinforcements caught up with us. Linhart had drawn two of them to the western group, leaving only one for Edelgard's group to handle. Both Edelgard and Sylvain needed another kill though, and I had to freeze the reinforcement mages with gambits for a couple turns to give them time to catch up. The boss himself was not very tricky though, with Hubert outranging with Meyer, and the defense debuff easily setting up the kill for Queen. Just before Queen deals the lethal blow, the boss opens Ceres' tomb, revealing a relic that we'll come to know as the Sword of the Creator. Here, Queen demonstrates her exclusive ability to wield the sword at its fullest potential, which is a bit mysterious considering her supposed lack of a crest stone. Regardless, Queen now joins Edelgard and Sylvain at just below level 10, setting us up for the next chapter. As tedious as it will still be. Fire Emblem, engage! We've successfully protected Firenay Castle, and the Queen, Ev, entrusts the Salico Ring with us, Queen. Looking past all this irony, Ev also informs us of Firenay's second emblem ring, which is hidden in a faraway shrine. On our way back to the Somnial, we enlist the services of the blacksmith, Kalni. We can now refine a lot of our weapons for improved stats, like might, as well as distribute our emblems in graves. Our first three engraves give fairly minor boosts, but being yet another way we can improve the combat performance for any unit is still appreciated. We also unlock the arena this chapter. This gives us a limited source of experience between chapters, and also lets us spend bond fragments to improve any unit's bond rank with any emblem. High bond ranks unlock more stat boosts, skills, and weapons when using that emblem, and I'll generally be using the arena to have each unit immediately skip past their first set of bond ranks. Here, I spend a bit more on Chloe to get to rank 10 and unlock the High Might experience boosting Mercurius. I don't plan to have Chloe kill everything with it, like some suggest, but immediately unlocking Mercurius should still be well worth the cost. On our way to the shrine, we encounter a rather zappy thief, Yunaka. She claims to have encountered the Ring of the Dawn Maiden, but lost it when she was attacked by bandits. Yunaka's killer eyes spot the bandits in the nearby village, and she leads Queen through a side path to retrieve the emblem ring, while the rest of our forces defeat the rest of the brigands. Our goal is to defeat the bandits' boss in the northwest, with Yunaka and Queen having a windy pathway in the north, while everyone else fights through enemies in the south. Yunaka's meant to have a great introduction, with plenty of thickets that give her 60 avoid and 15 crit, thanks to her covert tag and personal skill. Additionally, her thief vision helps with the fog of war that prevents our units from moving to tiles that are out of sight. She's not on my final team, but she'll still be useful for setting up kills. Upon starting the map, Yunaka moves to reveal the Emblem Ring's thief. After weakening them, Queen engages with Sigurd and takes the kill with Override. Poison's plus one damage received status, inflicted by daggers, is typically more influential for enemies, but in this one instance it helps Queen secure the kill. With the ring recovered, Queen is able to summon its emblem, Micaiah. She makes for quite the unique, support-based emblem, granting her wielder staff access, the engage skill augment that increases staff range and area of effect, and the engage attack Great Sacrifice that fully heals the entire party. Augment and Great Sacrifice in particular have some pretty crazy applications, but for now, Micaiah essentially just turns Yunaka into a super healer. Of course, this is still great, letting the southern group get away with a more aggressive approach. Chloe also engages turn 1, with Chloe taking the first Mirrodon kill. Etia stays behind in the south, hoping to dodge tank the southern brigand and longbow archer in the thicket, thanks to her covert tag. Everyone else follows behind Chloe, except Alfred, who goes even further, using Warp Ragnarok to immediately start fighting the enemies in the west. He's strong enough to two-shot the enemies, and bulky enough to survive several hits in spite of the poison going around. In being so far forward, he also clears away some fog, letting Chloe run forward to one round a brigand turn two, after he finishes off a thief he fought on enemy phase. Unfortunately, everyone else ends up having a bit of a rough time. Despite Queen having canter, and theoretically being able to quickly push forward through the corridor in the north, she misses a few attacks, delaying her progress. To help the south handle the assorted enemies coming from basically all directions, 
I have Yunaka engaged turn 2 and use Great Sacrifice. This let us survive the enemy phase, but things start getting pretty scary from there, as the enemies in the east have caught up with us, a brigand has joined the mage waiting in the thickets to our north, Etia is making very little progress in the south, and Chloe and Alfred still have a few more enemies to finish in the west. Queen is still a bit stuck in the north, but turn 3, I let Yunaka take a kill with Makaya's Shine Tome, which also reveals a 5 tile radius around her targets. Neat. For the southern group, I make do with continuing to push west, securing a safe area for my frailer units to run away to, while my bulkier units make a defensive formation to fight the enemies coming from the east. Chloe refills her emblem gauge in the west, but I decide to let Alfred refill his naturally, running back to help Etier in her fruitless endeavor in the south. When it comes to magic, Engage seems to take a step backward from the previous titles, reverting to tomes being a standard weapon type. Considering the focus on the new, complex Engage mechanic, though, I think this is a totally reasonable decision. This way, emblems are able to give any unit access to certain magical attacks in a way that feels natural to the player. Even though the early game hasn't reflected very well for magical combat, with mostly low magic units and not a ton of damage stacking available, our options for damage stacking are already turning around. Once our magic users get actually high attack values, they'll hit the wide variety of low resistance enemies really hard. I even feel that, more than any other game, mages are given a particularly strong matchup against knights and generals, with physical units dealing practically zero damage, while even our weaker mages can one round. Going back to the engage mechanic for a moment, I think that engage weapons make for an interesting way to give non-typical mages access to magical combat. We've already seen physical weapons with magical damage, like the Flame Sword in Thracia, and units have been able to straight up reclass to a tome wielding class since Shadow Dragon. Engage, however, provides unique tomes as emblem weapons, as we've seen with Alfred with Seraphim and Yunaka with Shine, which are locked behind being engaged, but otherwise can be used in any class. This gives a lot of flexibility when considering how magical combat is used in practice, and with clever team building, can be pushed past its traditional approach, all while fitting in with the game's overall focus on the engage mechanic. This shows in the end of my clear, in which Celica Alfred yet again pulls through. After he finally killed the enemies that Ete had been fighting since turn 1, I was in dire need of another strong attack against the boss in the northwest. Chloe did well enough, with Mercurius Lodestar Rush hitting very hard, and even getting some damage off with the Sigurd Engraved Javelin. Even Queen got to help out in the end, with her second engage with Sigurd, letting her reach and provide divinely inspiring. With Boucheron's chain attacks involved, I had got him to pretty low HP, but the cramped terrain made it difficult to set up a finishing strike. Enter. Magic's res targeting 2 range. Re-engaging with Celica, Alfred used Warp Ragnarok to move all the way over to the boss thanks to the cavalry tag's plus 2 warp range boost, and clutched out the kill. We have more long-term magical units joining us in the next part, but I have to say I'm very happy with the mystic contributions Alfred has provided thus far. And that wraps up part 5 of the Sync Marathon. In some ways, magic has been fairly static, consistently including 1-2 ranged tomes as a weapon type, targeting a separate resistance stat, and being tied to frail mages. That being said, there is certainly nuance as to how exactly magical combat is incorporated in each game. My first qualifier was if magic stands out from physical combat. This was tricky to pinpoint, but here I've laid out how strong magical combat felt to me in each game. The exact placements are debatable, but it shows the general trend that I'd like to convey. Magic starts fairly strong, hitting knights hard when physical units wouldn't, and having powerful spells like Excalibur, Aura, and Graf Caliber. Binding Blade marks a dip in the middle of the series, generally not hitting very hard and having pretty superfluous bonuses. Awakening, then, kicks magic back up to greatness, with every game sense giving the player ways to patch up mage's typical weaknesses while still having all their innate strengths. This puts the modern games high on my list, but I actually want to highlight FE1 and Engage as my favorite approaches to the strength of magical combat. This is exclusively for the matchup against knights, in which I found my physical units struggling the most, while the mages performed really well. I only placed the first games lower than the modern ones on my graph, because magic didn't feel particularly strong against other classes, while games like Awakening let you destroy every enemy with magic, knights or otherwise. As we've learned from Awakening though, just being strong doesn't mean that you're engaging. 
you'll note that Awakening is the one game that I didn't observe anything unique for, assuming that the Arcanea games get some sort of mana keat effectivity. We can, again, break this into three general phases. The first few games were experimental, having their own things going for them. Genealogy introduced Weapon Triangle, and the middle games played off this new supposed core feature of the series, giving magic its own set of advantages. The modern games transitioned away from this magic triangle, instead giving the player more tools to manipulate the traditional performance of mages. We've also seen the return of some features introduced all the way back in Gaiden, like spell lists and ignoring terrain. I think the magic triangle is a neat idea, theoretically making magic engaging to use both against physical and magical enemies. Outside of genealogy, though, I don't find the boosts are that impactful, and mages are just generally not a common enemy type. In practice, I like the modern approach a lot more, with Fates and Engage in particular letting you put together some pretty interesting magical builds. Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia is also very iconic, more so for the engaging turns rather than overall team planning. The spell lists encourage the player to consider what option is best fit for each mage every action, depending on their available spells, how much HP they have, and if you need high range, might, or hit. Three House's map durability is also pretty unique, but personally, it's not my favorites. My final qualifier was how well each approach to magic synergizes with the overall context of its game. This is kind of a niche question, with only a few games doing anything truly unique, but we can still make some interesting observations. For one, magic has at times been given effectivity against a class unique or important to its game. We haven't seen this in the marathon yet, but I know that Seraphim and Bishop's Slayer skill gives monster effectivity for Gaiden and Sacred Stone's monster-heavy games, and the Tellius games give Laguz effectivity for its elemental magic. I'm still convinced that there must be some sort of elemental mana keat effectivity for the Arcanea games, which would be cool if true, because I definitely know that's an iconic class. Of these, I'll point out Radiant Dawn as my favorite. I know Laguz play an integral part in the Tellius world, and Radiant Dawn gets a bonus, with an early game designed around showcasing its magical lord, Micaiah. The three times effectivity is also nice, letting careful positioning of Micaiah consistently be rewarded with Okos. As for the modern games, I think the approach of magical unit building fits especially well with Fates' reclassing and skill system, with Engage as a close second with its magical emblems. Lastly, Gaiden and Three House's unique approach to spell acquisition also fits in well with their games, with Three House's synergy of instructing and weapon rank standing out the most to me. With all this in mind, I think I can safely say that some of the middle games like Binding Blade and Shadow Dragon have my least favorite approach to magic. I found that they just don't really make magic stand out as strong, or even fun to use, being more akin to an archer that weakens enemies, rather than a mystical presence in my strategies. As an honorable mention, I'll bring up Engage, with its combat against knights being very memorable, and its emblems allowing for some pretty interesting unit builds. My three overall favorites, unsurprisingly, are Fates, Three Houses, and Shadows of Valentia. Fates' tomes may be as close to just a weapon type as they've ever been, but weapon balancing, the reclassing system, skills, attack stance, and even their place in the weapon triangle all give their combat a lot of unique depth and practice. Three Houses and Shadows of Valentia of course get credit for their spell systems, and ignoring terrain is a personal favorite aspect of magic for me. Gaiden's magic system may not have been immediately adapted, but I'm very glad to see traces of it brought back up, both in its remake and the other recent titles. We've now gotten our first mages in each game, but next part will still prove to be very important in building our teams. In Blazing Blade, we'll complete our Lord Trio, with Lin and some other important units joining Hector. In Three Houses, our team will get quite the shift in strength as they push towards our first intermediate classes. We'll also be doing the early paralogues for Awakening and Gage to get the Villager units, which I know I'll be using at least one of. Now, there's a lot to be said about magic and Fire Emblem, so if you think I missed something important, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. I've also started a small Discord server, which I've linked in the description, where we can talk about Fire Emblem between uploads, and you can get more detailed updates on future videos. As always, you can also vote for the next part's topic in the community section, and if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time!